Welcome to the Healing Place podcast, a space filled with inspirational stories of hope, along with practical advice for your healing journey. Your host is Terry Welbrock, trauma warrior, writer, speaker, blogger, therapy dog handler, and founder of the Sammy's Bundles of Hope Project. As a survivor and a thriver, Terry's mission is to shine the light of hope into the world by interviewing insightful guests from across the globe. Please stay tuned at the end of today's interview as we honor our sponsors. The Healing Place podcast is a fiscally sponsored project of Fractured Atlas. Now, here's your host and trauma warrior, Terry Welbrock. Welcome, everybody, to the Healing Place podcast. I am your host, Terry Welbrock, and very excited to have with me today Dr. Nisha Manick. Did I say it right? Oh, perfect. Awesome. Hi, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Such a beautiful name. It just rolls. So, yeah, so here to talk to us today about just some amazing stuff that I'm excited to learn about the power of intention, integrative medicine, um, her book, Bridging Science and Spirit The Genius of William A. Tiller's Physics and the Promise of information medicine information medicine i couldn't even read my own handwriting goodness gracious so, <laughs> so yeah so talk to us about what it is you do in the world terry good to join you this morning hello from california and um well i'm a medical doctor by profession and um, i'm a rheumatologist and a rheumatologist is a is a physician that deals with chronic diseases. Uh, mostly it's thought about as joints, but the more accurate way to think about rheumatology is that it is a disease uh, or a specialty looking at diseases of the immune system. So um, I deal with, with uh, people with uh, systemic lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and then other joint diseases such as gout and osteoarthritis. So in a nutshell, it's, you know, once I have a patient in my office, it's a, it's a long-term relationship, okay? So that's been my career, you know, medical doctor, joining hospital systems until about 10 years ago. And, and then I took a major change in the, in the trajectory. Awesome. Yeah, I have uh, a few friends who, who battle uh, autoimmune diseases themselves. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, just what a, what a struggle it can be because there's just not a quote unquote cure, correct? In the, in the yeah. physiological part of it. Yeah, you know, so in, in medicine, how we think about healing or, and, and you know, in fact, you were, um, you, you bring to my mind this early mor morning meditation. I have coffee and I really think about the day and then I have 20 minutes of complete silence and I just sit there um, on a chair, just, you know, close my eyes, breathe in and out and consider. Um, and, and mostly now the meditation is very quiet. And a thought came today and the thought was this, medicine you know, how we approach healing is that we deconstruct the human body. We make it into parts. We make it into systems. We make it into anatomy, biochemistry, physiology. And then we go even further into biochemistry and look at reactions in the cell. And we try to understand it. And then we reconstruct it back to the whole human. And right away, you know, when I was a medical student, this was beautiful. I thought, wow, you know, we're getting into the nuts and bolts of hum human healing and humanity, what makes us whole. And it was completely uh, misplaced, you know. And in Bridging Science and Spirit, I actually write a letter to my younger self because I thought that this uh, rational way of thinking, of constructing medicine was the holy grail. And I was wrong. I was wrong. And I think we have, uh, we now realize it, that we have created systems that are limiting. Uh, a human being is not a bunch of anatomy and biochemical reactions. We are much more than that. And so what is holistic healing? 
And so here I was in a major medical system. Actually, I was at the Mayo Clinic and I was always, um, I did very exceptional, you, you, I, I wouldn't say me, but I think conventional care has come a long way to understanding the, the human uh, body, okay, the, the atoms, molecules, stuff of it, but it isn't the entire system. And so here I am in, in a very uh, celebrated system, um, and I was really pushing against the boundaries because um, the cookie cutter system of I'm going to analyze your blood system, I'm going to uh, find out what's wrong with you, and we're going to fix it. We're going to prescribe a, a molecule, and it's going to work. It's going to be magic. And and many times it was. I, I have to say that when I had some molecules, such as a steroid, it brings us a long way to um, you know alleviating the pain, uh, the the uh, biochemical imbalances, but it doesn't get us all the way. So there's a huge gap still, and that's what I was noting. Um, what 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 gets us all the way? I'm not sure I have all the answers, but really that took me into this whole system of integrative medicine. And I want to define the word integrative for your your listeners and your audience. Um, it used to be called complementary and alternative medicine, and we dropped the word alternative, okay? Alternative seems to indicate or was that we dump conventional and then we go to alternative systems, whatever they might be, naturopathic systems, Ayurvedic systems, functional medicine systems, and I think we, we go to you know, we, we leave conventional behind, we go here, and it still has gaps. And, and I think integrative is closer to what I do, and which is, I don't dump conventional. I do respect my medical school training. It, it is valuable in many, many ways, uh, but it isn't the whole story. So I link up these systems of um, what I call alternative care systems and link it up to conventional. Now you have a bigger picture, okay? Um, and, and so I very much in rheumatology tell my patients that, when, especially when they say, doctor, I wanna know about natural healing. And so we go to those questions that they specifically have and it's very individualized. Sometimes we have people that really are in pain. They have 20 swollen joints. Their blood chemistry is all over the place. This is not the time to start fasting, okay? This is not the time to start, you know, uh, doing um, naturopathy. I'm not saying no to them, but we really go to their questions and really uh, ultimately we want to be safe. I'm going to stop there for a moment for your questions and reflect back. Oh, sure. Well, I, it, what made me think is when I just moved here two weeks ago to our new home in South Carolina, um, I started to, to reach out to find a physician and switch. And my, my physician in Ohio had retired. And so for like a two or three week period, I had to find another one because I wanted to make sure they could transfer my records. And so when I called the office, I had asked, and when I called around here, uh, had asked for, you know, who in your office is the most um, holistic. And I'm so surprised to still find that I struggle to find a practitioner who has a more holistic approach to healing because I am not one. I don't take any medications. I'm not one to throw a pill at things. Not that I'm anti-medicine at all. It's just my own personal preference. Um, but I just, I, I really find it intriguing and I, I hope that it continues to blossom and grow. Well, you know, um, I have to say that integrative medicine is growing exponentially. Uh, if, if, if I can give you some reassurance. Awesome. And, and it's been going on. It's a movement that didn't start with medicine. It didn't start in a university. It didn't start with a professor. It didn't start with doctors. It started with people like you, okay? That movement was driven by the consumer. And so it is the consumer that has uh, really uh, gone to 
the integrative side in droves. And, and I can tell you, if you look at the statistics in America, if you look at uh, nas- nationwide and you do surveys, um, one in three adult Americans choose integrative uh, medicine in some form, okay, whether it's naturopathic, doctors, massage, acupuncture. So I'm giving you a basket sort of definition here, of course. And if you go to why the American is, uh, the adult American, and, and I should define this, adult, uh, adult American over the age of 18, that's when we say they're adults, okay? They're going one in three, so 30%. Over a hundred million Americans are going and they're going to these offices in Chinese medicine and massage. Why are they doing that? Why are they doing that? And the number one reason actually is um, they are looking to answers to reduce pain. They're suffering from pain. Pain in their neck, in their back, in their toe, (laughs) okay? Headaches, pain. Pain comes in many, many, many forms. So why is medicine failing them? We can say they're failing them, okay? They have looked to conventional care, are not getting answers, so they're going to integrative specialists. So right away, pain is a major gap in conventional care. We are very uh, looking at answers in prescriptions and it isn't always there. And we have a big problem now about addiction to opiates, okay? We have a major problem and the current administration is saying, okay, enough is enough. And then we run into pharmaceuticals, which is a big, big part of conventional care. But the second part is this. that Americans are turning to integrative medicine to find empowerment. They're trying to take back some of the answers within themselves, which is what you're trying to do, Terry. You're saying, let me do my homework. Let me find a partner, a healthcare provider that can listen to me, that can hear my concerns, that I'm not saying no to prescriptions, but who can hear me in all of my concerns. That is a holistic holistic caregiver that looks at the body, that looks at the mind, that looks at my concerns from an emotional standpoint. And I would add one other thing, and I'll come back to that, which is spiritual healing. Not healing, but to, to, uh, to really go and unpack that. Which brings me to another reason why Americans are going to uh, integrative medicine, which is this, it's rheumatic diseases. It's my conditions, it's the conditions I see in my office all the time. So I mentioned some of them, uh, neck pain, back pain, gout, and a big one is fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia, okay? We used to think that fibromyalgia was an immune condition. It turns out not to be true. Uh, Fibromyalgia, to to define it so your listeners understand what I'm talking about, is this widespread pain, myalgia, all muscles. Um, And we thought it was an immune disease because it was affecting young women in their prime, okay? Okay in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they are not functioning well. They are fatigued. They have brain fog and they have tender points. Okay, so initially in the 1990s, we defined fibromyalgia as uh, you, you press on certain parts of the body and yeah, they are literally hitting the roof. They literally jump up from the exam table and we defined certain tender points. Well, it's it was okay for a time and now we are redefined. In 2010, there's a new definition of fibromyalgia. It's a system-wide, they have certain things uh, and some women have brain fog, some women have irritable bowel syndrome, some women cannot focus, some women have such fatigue that they're not even able to function. They're on, they're flat on the back. They do a bit of housework, laundry, and they're fat, flat on the back. But there's another aspect of um, fibromyalgia, which is this 
inconceivable fatigue, okay? Um, so there's these definitions that became more uh, multi-system. There's a questionnaire if your listeners want to go into the Google. If you Google new definition of fibromyalgia, it's a PDF. It's free. You can do it. And so as a physician, I now use the new definition of fibromyalgia, which does not use tender points, okay? Because tender points is very subjective. How much you do four kilograms per, you know, meter square, it was very, very defined. And it doesn't really, everybody would be yelping with pain. I mean, so it didn't work. It, it defined for a while. We've got a new definition. And when I use that, um, which is a patient-centered questionnaire, I realized that they are underneath the scoring system. Underneath that, there is a story. Yeah. People come with stories. And especially with fibromyalgia, you know, they have had um, so many wonderful physicians look at them. They've had MRI up the wazoo. They've had lab testing after lab testing of normal testing and it's not in their heads this is very very real for them and we've come a long way in um, anatomy and neurology to understand that fibromyalgia is um, a threshold in the central nervous system of pain. So they might be sitting in the chair in front of me and when I say how much pain do you have they'll say it's 11 out of 10. Okay, so here they are, they're in your office, and the pain uh, system is not functioning, it's dysfunctional, all right? It's like the threshold has been reset to where they're feeling pain all the time. You can't have an 11 out of pain. Pain is something to protect the body, You're, to protect you from fire, from heat, from burning yourself, from cutting yourself. But nobody's cutting you. Nobody's putting a fire rod to your, you know, to you. And so how, where is the pain coming from? Where, where is this? And so you have to dive a little deeper. And a lot of times I can tell you, and this is, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from my own personal office perspective, or practice perspective. I'm not saying I'm not a neurologist, but I can tell you that fibromyalgia, a lot of times um, they have stories and it comes deeply. It's like it's been pushed away, a story that has now come into the physical realms and must be addressed. It cannot just be addressed by Lyrica and here's another opiate or here's another uh, sleeping pill. It must be, you have to go there. And in the safety of the questions of a office practice to go there um, and look at it, look at the story and unravel it, what, what meaning it has, but it could, because it's very unconscious. It's exactly. very unconscious. You have to bring it to the consciousness level and also give it meaning. You have to give it meaning, the story meaning, so that you can start to heal from that and begin to understand the manifestations of the pain are very real, um, to dive into the story with your physician in partnership. And sometimes it's not rheumatology at all. I have then referred them to psychology, to psychiatry, because they become aware that, oh my goodness, this thing has been like a monkey on my back. Um, and I've been thinking there's something physically wrong. It has physical manifestations, but you can't just go physically. You have to dive into the the mind, you have to dive into the emotions. And then sometimes when they're ready, you go into the spiritual practices and give them tools. Yes. When well, they're ready, when they're ready, okay? Because right. sometimes you just can't go and pray there. You have to look at the story, see how it has served you or not served you. And then um, when they're ready, then you say, okay. You know, and a lot of times when we go into the stories in the bedside, sometimes you can tell they're ready and wow, you know, um, I've had a lot of Kleenex boxes, okay? <laughs> Literally, we go through Kleenex boxes, but you have to feel when they're ready. If they're not ready, you don't force them there, but you have to say the MRI didn't show this. 
It is not a broken bone. This is, the brain is not multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is what we would have seen if it was. So you have to go through a lot of education pieces. It takes time and that's okay. Okay, if you have an hour and sometimes 80 minutes, and I do request a full you know, hour minimum at the, at the outset for a visit so we can really go to their questions. And this is my advice to you, Terry, as you're preparing to find your doctor, is to have clarity around the health questions you have. And, and I, I, I do ask my patients, what is the one thing or question in our meeting today? And even when I know my patients, if they have rheumatoid arthritis, I, you know, we say good morning, you know, we go through some of the, the questions to set the tone for the visit. Um, but, you know, I do say what's what you've come today. Uh, it's a three month visit. What is the real question for you today? And it may be many things and it gets a richer meeting, a richer relationship. So it's not just your pain level is two out of 10 and your joint was functioning. I mean, you, it's, it's important, but we do go deeper into the story. So my, my advice to you as you search for your next, uh, uh, you know, doctor, think of it as a long-term relationship and, yeah. and how you're going to forge that because it really is, you know, yeah. uh, what, are, well, what are the stories for you that, that need addressing? I think I, I think I educated my physician only because when I went in, we did form a wonderful relationship. As a matter of fact, she would, she would uh, email me through the system that we had, um, their doctor's system with like private messaging type of thing and yes. say, Hey, we've got these test results back. You know, I know that you, you know, I know your story. I know your history because when I went in, I just was like, bleh. And I just, because I understand when it comes up often here on the podcast, adverse childhood experiences and the way those experiences affect us on a physiological level, a mental level, a spiritual level, how it, it does impact us in so many ways. I mean, how the chances for diabetes can go up, the chances for heart disease, the chances mm -hmm. for suicide, suicidology uh, or suicide. What is the word? I'm so losing it. Suicide rates, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, because of because of those stories that you're talking about, and so I love it that you're addressing it and, and bringing it to light in relation you know, to you. Yeah, I, I, you know, you you do bring to mind several stories right away that, um, if I may share very quickly, one for your listeners was a very wonderful. Woman, she was actually in her 70s by the time she was referred to me in rheumatology. And um, the working diagnosis was just chronic neck pain. And would I have any insights? And I can tell you, this nice lady had gone through, I mean, I would say a million dollar workup. I, MRI, repeated MRIs, not one, <laughs> repeated MRIs of her neck. And it was constantly mild osteoarthritis. And so, you know, I'm a rheumatologist and, you know, osteoarthritis would come into my, my specialty. And so it was an appropriate referral. And she was sitting on the exam table <clears throat> and we gone through the stories um, or not the history, I should say. And, you know, I did a proper exam and she really had a full range of motion in her neck. There was no restriction. Her reflexes were fine. So there was no neurological sequelae of this osteoarthritis. And there was no uh, impingement. We say impingement. There's no bone spurs doing funky things on the nerves. And I said, there's got to be something more. And she, was, she, she looked fantastic. She didn't look 70. And I said to her, can we go somewhere else with this whole story? Because I'm impressed you've had this for years. Your pain level is high and you're smiling. And I said, I just want to explore this pain a little bit more. Can we do that? And she says, yes, I had the permission to go there. I had the permission. And I said, tell me exactly when this pain started. 
And she was a little confused. She says, well, I don't know. I said, no, no, we, we need to go there. Exactly what happened under, under the what circumstances you, you know, 20 years ago, whatever it was that this started. And you had to dig a, a little bit and just hold the space. And it was silent. Sometimes we were just quiet in the, in the, um, in the waiting. I mean, not waiting in my office. And then I did something. I said, okay. I'm going to switch off the light. I'm going to leave the room and you meditate on this for five, 10 minutes. Don't worry. It's your time. And you have all the time we need to, to go where the pain is. It's not in the physical body. Something else is going on and we need to go there to really resolve this. Okay. And I left the room and I came back and I switched on the light and she was looking a little pensive and, and I knew she had hit upon it. And I said, are you ready to talk about it? And she says, well, he's, he's, he's twisting my neck. And I said, okay, who's, who's twisting it? And she says, he's trying to kill me. Oh yeah. He was, and it, it turned out that it was her ex-husband who had tried to take her life and, and he was smothering her with the pillow. Oh, it was so traumatic that she had pushed it into her subconscious. And for a long time, she had gone about her life. She had divorced the man and had gone and thrived in her life. But this episode where she woke up in a terrified sense, he was twisting her neck and it was very real. And, and, and she cried, you know, and for a long time I said, okay, it's all right. You're safe. Let's, Thank you for sharing this very deeply personal and painful episode in your life. And, you know, can, can we, can we now go the next step? What do you think? And I put it to what do you think should be done? What, where, where can we go? You don't need more pain medic. And she immediately says, Oh my God, Oh my God, Oh my God. And, you know, so with her permission, we unpacked um, the pain that she had uh, the, the the stories that came after it. And then she actually went to psychology and, you know, and she never, I never saw her again. Oh, and I hope that she, she came off of, but one thing, one tool that I offered her was now you're ready to go into the heart of forgiveness. And this is where you have intention. Now you have, you know, the, you see, now you have created a space when you have seen the story for your intention to take root. Now you have power. Okay. Intention cannot, otherwise, you know, my pain will go away. Well, it, you, your intention is very loose. And so we created a space for her to have a very powerful statement. Okay. And you have words that now can take shape, not only for your own, physical healing but for the other person because they were doing things that were hurting also okay yes. so yeah. you release yourself and you release the other person and what what was interesting to me when i when i reached in my own medical integrative understanding was in rheumatology there are stories and i can give you many many stories but this is just one example and in in at first, Terry, I was going into, I thought, uh, you know, when we deconstruct the human body, the subtle energy system, the biofield, I wanted to go there because I knew it had a lot of power to uh, jump, to jump, start healing, to uh, give more energy, to build on the conventional care. And it does. Tai Chi and acupuncture and yoga, these are important practices, and I actually regularly prescribe them. But what, what happened was, when I reached out to William Tiller, uh, who's the physics mentor I write about in my book, Bridging Science and Spirit, I thought I was going to learn all about subtle energies, and, you know, be a holy grail. And actually, it was much, much more. My paradigm and my mindset shifted not just from conventional excellence there and building on it and building on it with energy medicine, but it built on this intention piece. 
Because when you do Tai Chi and when you do energy or when you go to an energy practitioner, your intention is playing out. Even as you do your homework to find a new, uh, you know, doctor to, to partner with for your well-being and health, your intention is playing out and your motivation is playing out. So, you know, you have to be very aware. And so when I was looking for understanding subtle energies, my intention played out. But something more was a gift with Bill Tiller's work was that intention is a very powerful force in the universe. Amen. Intention is uh, your intention, your creation of that sentence or information. Now, information is very fundamental to the fabric of the universe. Okay, it's not atoms and molecules. That's matter. Matter is a very small part of who you are. It's just a very small tangible thing that we examine that I do blood tests on. But the more powerful system energy and the more powerful system beyond that is your intention. Because intention is your consciousness. Now we have something even more beautiful. Consciousness is not just the brain. It's your heart. It's your deepest desires playing out. And consciousness is shaped by our uh, youth, our culture, our home, our parents. It's a lot of things wrapped in there. And once you understand your consciousness and your intention being shaped by that, consciousness is your link to something even bigger. It's spirit. Now you have a bigger story. And the mystics have been always truthful. It's the truth that stands the test of all time. Science changes. Science builds. Science, you know, is deconstructing. But spirit, now you have a different sense of wholeness. And so with this lady, we went there a little bit. It was wrapped into that visit. Thank God she allowed me to go to the painful process. She began to see the patterns that no longer served her at this point. It did for a while. She survived it. She was stronger for it. My goodness, how strong, you know. She divorced and she built up a system, but now it was at a stage, you could say at a stage of potential, that now she was ready to go there and see the story for what it was and move on. She was bigger now. She had been led to a place willingly. She, it was her own healing, okay? I was just leading her there in the safety of the clinic and saying, we are now ready. You're now ready to grow away from this and heal totally. And now you can link to spirit. This is where intention comes in. Prayer comes in, okay? So what Tiller did was very interesting. He showed that, first of all, human intention is a powerful force. I mean, I'm, I hope I can convey a something of that. I know you don't have video. I'm in my, in my little room here. Uh, you know, this is the shelter in place where we're having, you know, lots of workspaces and we're pivoting all the time. The intention is always there. Yeah. And in my met morning meditation was, what's the medicine all about? And figuring out that we're in discrete parts, and then the subtle energies come in, the intention is there, and that the bigger picture is spirit. And for this patient, I actually gave her Psalm 91, okay? I gave her Psalm 91. I'm not Catholic, uh, but one of my teachers um, is David Hawkins, who really showed me that when you talk about consciousness, it's not just one thing. Consciousness has many levels, okay? And they increase in power. You can have greed and courage, and then you have willingness, and medicine is very powerful. It has intellect, but beyond that is the level of the heart. Yes. And Tiller is the level of the heart. His physics is coming from the heart. He doesn't do physics just to be in journals and to win Nobel Prizes. 
He does physics and his science is to serve humankind. Now you have a different kind of a science. It's not let me pay the bills, let me do the, you know, click boxes and, and, and the administrators are going to say you have to seen your 20 patients for the day. And I had to walk away from that system to really recollect why am I in this whole profession in the first place? And it was to bridge science and spirit because as human beings, we're looking for a deeper relationship all the time all the time every relationship is a sacred one okay yes. and once we understand that everyone benefits it's for the highest good and highest good includes the doctor it includes the patient includes the pharmacy industry i know people will object when i that i'm saying this <laughs> but it is so true and we must stop carving out this little niche and you know uh, my turf and your turf kind of nonsense it's nonsense and for this lady it was saying you know you have been served okay. The good news is here is your physical system is not damaged, but your emotional and mental systems have been damaged. And for goodness sake, you have powered through for a long time, and now you're ready. Now you're ready to step into your own light, and spirit will help you. Spirit is always there. Omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient it is absolutely true and so i offered her tool of psalm 91. so bill tiller has shown that the human intention once it is joined with divine spirit so in his experiments in physics physics lab he created an intention okay he writes you know, let me change this pH of blah, water. I'm saying blah. <laughs> but that was his really, he's a material science scientist at Stanford. He's now retired. But he did this awesome, very courageous research in line with conventional care and said, my intention, can it really do things? Because we're all intending all the time. How come we don't see changes? He defined the conditions where intentions have very enormous effects, okay? Enormous. You can measure these effects. But it comes down to this. You must get rid of the noise in your mind. And if you have skepticism, notice it and let it just drop it away or let it keep, keep it on its side and then test it out in your own life. And for that, you know, I want readers to go to the book. Bridging Science and Spirit, because there's a lot here. We could have a whole week conference on yes. this. Okay, I mean, it's not possible. But I would say as a physician, as a physician, it has changed me as a physician fundamentally, okay, that there are things beyond just the body's systems, the atoms and the molecules and the, and the biochemical reactions, they are very real, but we have a responsibility a responsibility to make our patients aware that they are energetic systems and you can build on that. Here's a breathing exercise, here's a Tai Chi exercise, and then build more when patients have fear around my medicines. Because I do, pre I do prescribe, you know, I do methotrex, I do look after people with rheumatoid, and, you know, I can't pretend that they're in pain, and I can't pretend that they have, don't have a disease. I say, here's an education around your arthritis, and the good news is, you are much more than this, but we we're going to pay attention to the body like this. And when they're fearful is to use intention, to meet them where they are and say, what is the fear? What's the worst possible thing from this medication? What is your fears? And they do internet. They go and do Dr. Google and Google searches and you, you go there. You, again, we unpack the fears because they're real. Okay, right. we have to respect that. And once we have education, then they're ready. And sometimes I say, we have to go here quickly. You don't go months and months Googling forever. You know, you have to have real, realistic and pragmatic things. So sometimes I will say, I'm very direct. Okay, and some, if they're ready, they will, they will have enormous benefit too. And so I build on intention. I teach them how to uh, write a sentence, write it out, 
and we create it at the bedside and it's very uh, it's it's a very beautiful exercise i can honestly tell you that that the um we both uh search for the right word and there's a click feeling that oh, this is so awesome and they take pictures of it they'll take it away with them and they come a different person the next time okay so we build there they are um standing in their own light it isn't about me i'm not the authority they are the authority in their life in their yeah. healing okay Let's and i do that the tools. yeah for just a second, we're into spirit. Part of it is you yes. mentioned forgiveness. I myself utilize Ho'oponopono Hawaiian healing and I yes. also write letters of forgiveness. And so yes. it's been very healing for me along my own healing journey. So, so tap in a little bit about forgiveness part of it. Yeah, forgiveness is an incredible tool. Um, this is... Um, I'm reaching into a course in miracles, but all spiritual traditions are united in that because forgiveness is a profound tool of love. It's self-love. And when you are in love, in, in the field of love, then there is a letting go. You are not wedded to a particular position my viewpoint, he did this and wrong, because everyone is suffering. There is a cry out of pain when somebody is doing something bad. Uh, when I see the civil unrest right now outside, you know, we have witnessed terrible destruction. It's the cry for pain. They're, they're crying out, but they're asleep. Humanity is slow to learn. So these young people or whoever are completely asleep. Forgiveness wakens us up. Okay. It is a tool to waken us up to the greater good, to the greater context, not just the content of all this pain, all this destruction and all woe is me and victims, but rather looking at the greater context. And I'll tell you something, you know, um, I have a, uh, a wonderful friend in New York City. And, you know, we're both writing our books. I'm writing my second one. Um, and Rebecca, and she says, Nisha, I want to just rush out and protest with everybody else. And I said, stay indoors. Because staying indoors is not selfishness. Staying indoors is self-preservation and it is the biggest tool of political warfare. OK, because it is a protest. It is like a protest to stay indoors and forgive. It is absolutely a tool of warfare. So make no mistake about it. Jesus was correct. Forgive and choose again. We have choices every single time. My brother choose again. So I'm not saying resist or ignore the protest, but I choose something different. Yeah. I choose forgiveness and I choose love every single time. And so our traditions come, they unite in that message, actually, any tradition. And I've looked at Buddhism. My book has met Lord Shiva shows up. Uh, Swami Yogananda of the Self-Realization Fellowship makes his presence known. Padre Pio, the Saint Pio of Italy shows up so you know and then saint john and saint matthew show up so make no mistake about it where more two or more are gathered in my name is saint matthew okay they all come don't mistake spiritual traditions they are not separate we have they're just tools they're ten thousand pathways home and one time, you know, I complained to Dr. Tiller, I don't think science can ever come to consciousness. And he said, you know something, Nisha? Because I was in the subtle energy mode, okay? And he said, you know, when you ask the question with great sensitivity, he didn't say all that, but he just said, science is a way to self-knowledge. Know thyself. Once you know thyself, even science is a beautiful way home. For him, science is 
home. He said, you know, it's just the next rung. Uh, we've discovered the Higgs boson. It's the electromagnetic particle world. We have completed it. We are now poised for the next jump. We must go there. And that's the unseen, nonlinear world of science. And that too is limited. And we'll keep advancing because we're evolving. Humankind is not stuck in this matter world. We're, we're homo sapiens, but we are evolving into homo universalis, the brotherhood of man. Now, the, this teacher, one of my teachers has said this to me, that, you know, in your time, Nisha, homo sapiens is going to be homo universalis. I love it. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So is there anything else that you wanted to touch upon and let uh, the audience know about that we haven't yet delved into? I know we could sit and talk for hours upon hours. <laughs> well, Terry, you've been so generous because I've just continued to talk. As you can see, I get on a train and I'm on that train. I love it. <laughs> you can't get off. <laughs> but I want to say this and to all the listeners that with the pandemic, with all of the unrest, we are in an election year. The world is not the same anymore, no matter what. There is no normal, going back to normal. Know this, that you have at your disposable, or oh, disposable, disposable, your, let's dispose of the old world. We are going to recreate yeah. our new realities and you have great great inner potential more than you can ever know and you are within your power go discover it do not be despondent but rise up to the challenge in your own home meditate look at the question look at the stories if they don't serve you well create a bigger one better one okay and uh, Terry, I think you have done a big service to your listeners by, you know, bringing these questions and making them available, laying them all out. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, I feel it's such a soul calling. It's just my, my soul purpose. And it brings me so much joy. I, I sit here and I smile, you know, when, when I listen to my guests talk and listening to you talk because it resonates with my heart and it resonates with my soul and I love it. So, yeah. Thank you, Terry. Well, you have a wonderful, wonderful start to a Tuesday. Oh, thank you. So <laughs> let me ask you real quick, how do people find you? How do they get a hold of you? And yes. Uh, right now I'm doing telemedicine because the practice in, in California is closed and there's a second way. But my intention is I'm writing my second book on a very specific area of Bill Tiller's physics. And I realized that when he was doing his intention experiments, I talk about the great unseen doing the heavy lifting. And I once asked Dr. Tiller, what is or who are this unseen? And he told me. I didn't think of it very much at the time. Fast forward, I'm realizing I need to go there to write about, um, you know, the great unseen. Who are the angels who help us, yeah. who link arms yeah. with, with Tiller? Yeah. And, and this isn't just a feel-good exercise. This is real nuts and bolts. Angels are not just feeling good. You know, I'm, uh, uh, in fact, one of my teachers has said, we are not about feeling good all the time. We're addicted to feeling good. We are human beings. We must grow up. And so this book is really exploring this relationship of the unseen and Tiller, particularly how this plays out in science. So my intention in this quiet time has been actually very rewarding. A lot of my time is, of course, at the bedside. So the telemedicine is uh, underserved populations in the upper Midwest. And it's been a real gift because I do have a little bit of an income. <laughs> so I do that. I write my book and really also look at this whole question of intention in more detail. What does it really mean to intend? Because to me, it was very obvious. And I realized it's not that obvious. You have to clear the field. How do you do that? How do you, how do you, what are the shiny objects that people want? It starts there often, you know, what is the next shiny object I want? Because I do that too. And that's okay. 
and then you go into the deeper layers of intention. So I'm looking at that aspect. What does it mean to have intention? What does it mean to have a powerful intention? And how do you link up with the divine? Because it will work. Whenever you have a prayer, you, you, the Father always answers. The divine cannot but supply you okay <laughs> that that really is true so uh where how people can find me right now is my website and you can sign up for my email it's a very small email list i'm not used to doing these things but hey it's there but nisha manek md.com so n-i-s-h-a manek m-a-n-e-k md.com all one word nisha manek md.com and I, I hope that they will go and pick up a copy of this book. And I'm happy to say, Terry, this is the other intention part. The pandemic, uh, you know, had a significant effect in that the print copies didn't go out. And so it was non-essential. The ebook flew, but the, uh, but the print books didn't. So I'm having an audio book created for Bridging Science and Spirit. So I hope your listeners will tune in. And in another couple of months, the audiobook, which I have a terrific narrator, uh, will, will uh, do a great job. And I'm very excited about that. Oh, my gosh, that's wonderful. And I can't wait to read the second book. I mean, well, the first one book, too. But yeah, the second one, yeah. I'm very excited. Yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah. I, I, the, the unseen is there, and I can tell you, I didn't realize how active they are, even oh, in sure. the freaking yeah. science and spirit. Where I, I, a lot of times, you know, I'm not a physicist, and um, I prayed. There were certain weak links, you might say, in the bridge, the construction. I was engineering this bridge, and my editor says, ah, I don't think, I don't believe that. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I prayed over it and uh, I, wow. I mean, they absolutely answered me and I was encouraged. And I would say, I would get, you know, people say I get goosebumps and I'm a doctor. And I thought, I don't know what they're talking about. Uh-huh. Yes, there's something to it all <laughs> that, uh, that you're answered and there are absolute tangible things that, yeah. This is the information that you're being supplied with. And I won't go into that because it's my personal tools and, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And again, thank you for being here and shining your beautiful light of hope and for the work you're doing uh, to help others along their healing journey. Thank you, Terry, for having me. Bye-bye for now. Absolutely. Everyone, until next time, remember, be gentle with yourself. Thank you so much for listening today to the Healing Place podcast with your host and trauma warrior, Terry Welbrock. If you enjoyed this episode and want to learn more about Terry, her mission, and the Hope for Healing journey, visit Terry's website at www.terrywellbrock.com. Thank you for liking, commenting, sharing, and offering your reviews on our YouTube channel, audio outlets, and Facebook page. And as Terry reminds us, until next time, remember, be gentle with yourself.